so the quote is, I think you will be seeing wines with more personality, some more extreme than others, but at the same time, trying to accentuate sense of place. You know, it's not too many times that we get, uh, you know, wine spectator quoted uh, winemakers next to us here mm. uh, at The Extract. I'm Kyle Meyer. Welcome to The Extract. This is Rodrigo Soto, world famous wine spectator quoted uh, winemaker. <laughs> <laughs> With a lot of fingers and a lot of pies. Nope. Um, congratulations. No, but this is pretty big. It's always good. Always good. When I have a lot of respect for the wine spectator. So they always have been very supportive to Chile. And, and, yeah. and hopefully it's going to help us uh, turn the corner in, uh, in terms of uh, image of our country and the beautiful wines that are coming out of it. But what you say is true. Um, more personality, more extreme. Those are two major factors that we're seeing with the new age of Chilean wine. So, you know, it's just pretty exciting stuff. Yep. Good times. Good times in Chile. And I think there's a new generation of winemakers. There's a lot of talent there. They're much more traveled. And I think we're a little more open and less conservative. Right. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 obviously. I mean, I mean, because, because, because seriously, Rodrigo, I mean, would we be talking Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir and Chile even a decade ago? Well, probably not. Probably not Pinot, not for sure. Sauvignon no. Blanc, maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> but it's, uh, but with Pinot, I think that uh, it's an ambitious, a um, very ambitious challenge. I think, but I'm sure you're gonna start seeing really interesting stuff. And hopefully, you will, you will like it a lot. Who the hell came up with Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir in Chile after after decades of? Cabernet, Merlot, da 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 da, and then and then and then, <laughs> oh yeah, there's this grape that we didn't even know was this grape, Carmenere, right? Oh, wow. And now and now all of a sudden, Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir are like hot buttons yep. in Chile. That's Why? We were talking earlier this morning. I think that uh, in the mid '90s there was a lot of uh, kind of a kind of a revolution in the industry in terms of a lot of new projects starting, mm -hmm. and uh, at the same time with this. Uh, Kind of incentive of really developing different kind of wineries and projects was the kind of the discovery of cool climate appellations starting with Casablanca then was San Antonio then Leida then Bio Bio and as you know Chile is a long country I mean yep. there's a lot of coast there and for some reason we like looking at the Andes and not too much at the ocean <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, uh, well, you know, but I don't think a lot of people understand. When you talk about a lot of coast, yeah. and we'll flash the map of Chile up there so people can see it. Right. But when we, we talk about a lot of coast, there's like warm coast yep. and there's cool coast. Yes. Right? Yep. So so the deal here with, uh, for example, the Casablanca Valley, where is the Casablanca Valley in Chile? Just so we get an so idea. So you place it in the map. Santiago is the capital city right in the center of the country. And if you go northwest towards uh, uh, the Pacific, it's on the same route going to Valparaiso or Viña del Mar, which is one of the main ports in Chile. And uh, so you go exactly towards uh, the Pacific influence. And it's the same influence that you get in uh, Northern California, like mm -hmm. in the Russian River, basically. I mean, very, okay. very similar effect of the coolness, the foggy mornings, the cold nights, uh, and it's a very cold ocean. So definitely it affects the whole dynamic of the growth in that area. Mm -hmm. And when did you plant Pinot Noir and Sauvignon Blanc in this Casablanca Valley? So uh, Casablanca was discovered in the 80s, and these plantations are dated from mid-90s. Mid-90s, so okay. So they're starting to reach, getting out of their teenage uh, age, and they're starting to show a little bit of its uh, true sense of uh, adaptation mm -hmm. to their location, I think. So. The, but, I mean, you, you, put, you put these sticks in the ground before having any reputation or even any concept. <laughs> A Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Noir as uh, potentially viable uh, in the country. It's like literally Pinot Noir starting in the Russian River Valley in the 60s, like from scratch. Right, very much. And a couple folks like the Rokiolis or something putting sticks in the ground and going like, let's see how it does. Yeah. The results here in a very short period of time yeah. are very impressive. Did you guys know? Well, no idea. This was a big bet, I think. But, uh, but always, I mean, and I always say the same thing. Seeing the example that you just said, like the Rocciolis or the Dellingers or mm -hmm. people that were there early on, and they take a very high risk and they show everybody that it can be done. Mm -hmm. I think that Chile is going through a very similar process 20 years behind 
what mm-hmm. happened yeah. in California at those day, on those at that time. So I think it's a. I will say going to California and see what's happening in the Sonoma Coast in the Russian River is like seeing the Oracle and then coming back to Chile, going back to the past and have <laughs> with a little extra information and it gives you a very uh, good <laughs> indication. Hey, you gotta pursue this because it can happen. It's it like Back to done. the Future. Hey, totally. Because what you're doing, you're doing the same thing, but you're doing it with the with the best technology and the most and the greatest modern winemaking conveniences on hand, huh? Well, we have a we have been going that route, but honestly, I think that we have been going a little backwards in that sense as well. Right. Obviously, you're utilizing technology, but you realize that technology sometimes get a little bit out of control and out of sync. And I think mm-hmm. we have been going back to very conventional, traditional practices for making this wine. So. Uh, with the utilization of some technology, but also some handcraft techniques that mm-hmm. from ancient producers. So, right, like 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 with the Pinot Noir, because this is because I was reading the dossier on it, and um, seriously, this is Pinot Noir, but it's all about less is more, right? Well, I think some people like that concept, some others don't. Uh-huh. I think that the beauty of Pinot and the austerity that it shows, it's always interesting that the less you do, the more it shows. The more you do, n- not normally shows uh, the sense of place, but it yeah. can show maybe somebody's personality. Mm-hmm. I think it's not the intention of this wine. Right. It really definitely wants to showcase location and what can be done in this case in Casablanca. Mm. Guys, you know, I stick my face in this wine and, and, Pinot, and Chilean Pinot Noir. I can't believe we're even talking about this. <laughs> Chilean Pinot Noir has come so far oh. in such a short period of time. Yeah. It's it's literally a meteoric rise. Yep. This wine, in comparison to what like the eleven or twelve yep. ritual Pinot Noir, it, it's it's night and day. Yep. There's such it's great big. purity of fruit, definition, and elegance and perfume. Hey, thank you. I'm very pleased with this uh, 2014 version. And you know, I mean, going always a little farther. I mean, now utilizing whole cluster. I know everybody's you, a lot of. Interesting wine. No, 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 don't, but, don't, but, don't quantify it. Oh. I mean, what, what are you learning in this process? What are you doing different, even from three, four years ago? It's a lot of things. In terms of farming, I think that the conversion of a conventional vineyard to organic farming is a tremendous step up. Mm-hmm. It's hard to prove it and to have kind of scientific evidence of that is true or not. But in my opinion, what we have done in this transition is really bring up natural flavors of this variety adapted to a very particular site with decomposed granite, with a Mediterranean climate, close to the coast, and that's what you get. The less you do in terms of farming, the more you get in terms of flavors. <laughs> I think that's it. And, and, and mirroring that at the winery with native fermentations, very kind of austere use of new oak mm-hmm. and also the right amount of the aging of, of, of the aging amount of time yeah. I mean, basic all very basic techniques but at the very end when you start kind of putting things together it start making a lot of sense and it starts showcasing in the glass room uh, you know I talked to a lot of top Pinot Noir winemakers and they talked about the relevance of native yeast fermentation yeah and, and what it does for the flavor of the wine or the oh. texture, whatever. What, what, what's the difference? What does that native yeast fermentation bring it's, to the it's, table? It's a tremendous difference. But, and the, the dynamic of the fermentation is completely different. It's much mellower. You don't reach very high temperatures, which is very nice, by the way, because you don't extract just with the temperature and the alcohol in the fermentation. You got to go there and allows you to take better decisions. You have more time to pump over or punch down whatever technique you want to utilize depending on your fruit, depending on the location of the fruit. Uh, but at the very end, it gives you much more balanced wines. It gives you true aromatics of that particular location rather than imposed aromatics from commercial yeast. Mm. Yeah, That wine's like stupid good. Hey, thanks a lot. Congratulations for the money. That's, that's dumb. That's um, but But... Also, let's not forget what kind of put Chile on the map yep. and the ongoing progress you're making with, with brands like, like, like Primus. And, and this is not a commercial, kids. I mean, this is like these wines have just jumped so far stratospherically in quality the last mm-hmm. several years that they have become beyond relevant in the world of fine wine. And that's what we have to realize and understand here. 
What's, what's happened in the Colchawa Valley? What's happened with some of these Bordeaux varieties the last few years? Well, Colchawa is going through a similar process and this, in these two properties that we have, one in Marchiwe, the other one in Apalta. And uh, both of them are going through this transition of farming. And one of the things that I've been noticing, because Colchawa tends to be a little bit warmer and mm -hmm. had more clay in the soil. So whenever you have a heat wave or warmer climate, if it's conventionally farmed, the plant tends to immediately demand a lot of water and start struggling with the <coughs> environmental conditions. Mm. This vineyard now has been taking some warm vintage with extremely outstanding capacity to self-regulate and doesn't shrink, doesn't show any sense or uh, flavors of having a, a warmer situation and definitely start really adapting and showing the natural conditions of Colchagua. So similar process that we just described with the Pinot, but with other varieties. And the same thing with, as you know, with some varieties that are not native to Chile, but has been there for a while. Uh, it takes time for them to be adapted. It takes time for us, instead of copying farming techniques from other countries yeah. to start utilizing our own yeah. and start really uh, adjusting our and tailor farming for our needs, not for somebody uh, consulting or somebody coming from another country telling you what to do. I yeah. mean, this is, needs to be uh, homemade. Right. Yeah. Does that new concept in the vineyard make life easier for you in the winery when you're making the wine? Or Life in the winery now is extremely simple. It's very <laughs> true. And, uh, and we spend a lot more time working in the vineyards. But at the very end, everything starts getting in sync and in a very natural way. So absolutely, yes. And the process in the winery, I mean, we're trying to subtract variables and try to make it a very standard, very easy going process, and very natural process. For a final thought, I got to ask you, it's on the tip of everyone's tongues. Okay, no, it's just on mine. Uh, Carmen Air, how's that uh, going? Carmen Air has been through a tough evolution, <laughs> I will say. You know what, and, and, and sorry if I extend with this, but Carmen Air was such a good story early on. Right. That our friends in the commercial departments get hyperventilated, <laughs> thinking that they can sell a variety because it was like Carmen for Chileans was going to be like Malbec for Argentinians. Right. And nothing worse than that, that jump ahead of the quality of the variety, of the quality of the wines that needs to be made. And I think we struggled because we get a lot of pushback from the market with all the reason yeah. because the wines were awful. And, <laughs> uh, and you know what happened? I mean, we have learned from our mistakes. I think that today, today, 2015, you go and buy some good commoners and you find some good commoners there. Personally, I believe that it's a great blending component. I think mm. it's a very hard standalone variety yeah, that we yeah. can standalone wine. But still, it can be made in very particular locations. So, hard story for commoner. We feel very nationalistic about commoner. Right, but, uh, right. Sometimes, as uh, we no. don't know, we, we cannot but, get it personal. But what you're saying is the folks in Bordeaux were right back in the 1850s <laughs> and 1860s. Well, I heard they were planting now when, with global warming and stuff like that, but uh, I, I think they were A couple were percent right. in the mix or, you know, 10% yeah. and then you're like, yeah. It always adds something and yeah. it's going to give a, a, an interesting fingerprint, but it cannot dominate the wine. I don't yeah. think that's fair for the wine. Yeah. Well, I mean, Rodrigo, bless your heart, you have one of the coolest jobs in the wine world right now, I would say. Uh, being on the edge of just this revolution that's taking place in Chile right now and, and actually spearheading it. Yep. Uh, congratulations. Well, These thank are you very much and glad really to be here. Them. Thank you for the opportunity to share the wines with you guys. Thanks yeah, a lot. Yeah, I might have to suck down another glass of Pinot Noir before we finish. Yeah. Thank Cheers. You. Cheers.